Good evening. I call to order this April 19th meeting of the Winston-Salem City Council and would say to the audience that pursuant to the policy and procedures adopted by the City Council relative to virtual meetings, I've determined that it's not feasible for the City Council and I to meet together tonight physically. And then due to the Safer at Home order, all council members are participating virtually. Council members will vote by roll call. The council member will be recognized and will state their vote. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Larson. Present. Councilmember Clark. Here. Councilmember Mundy. Present. Councilmember Scipio. Present. Mayor Potem Adams. Here. Councilmember Taylor. Present. Councilmember McIntosh. Here. Councilmember Burke. Here. Thank you. All council members are present. Would you please join the city council and me in a moment of silence? Thank you. Tonight's agenda of the city council is comprised of two parts, the general agenda and the consent agenda. It's always the practice of this council to take the consent agenda as the first order of business. Uh, there'll be no discussion of the items on this agenda unless a council member requests that an item be removed and be considered individually. Items not removed from the consent agenda will be enacted with one motion. We're televising this meeting live tonight on TV 13, and it will be replayed tomorrow at 9 a.m. and again Wednesday at 9 p.m. Of course, copies of our uh, agenda as well as videos of previous meetings are always available to members of the public by simply going to the city's website and click on the watch meetings online link. Council members, are there any items you wish to pull from the consent agenda? Mayor, I move approval of the uh, consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, hold just a minute. Council Member Mundy, did you have an item? Just a reminder that we were going to discuss uh, C21. I don't know if it needs to be pulled from the agenda, but this is uh, these are the inductees into the Winston-Salem Arts, Culture, and Entertainment Walk. I'm not uh, suggesting that we pull it unless that's required to um, yeah. highlight these. Yeah, let's pull it, and then we'll vote on the rest of the agenda. Uh, Councilmember Adam, I may appear to Adams. Would you amend your motion to approve the balance uh, other than item C21? I move to amend the balance of the consent agenda uh, minus item 21. Second, CPO. Thank you. Uh, we'll do a roll call to approve the <clears throat> balance of the agenda. Uh, Councilmember Larson? Yes. Councilmember Clark? Yes. Councilmember Mundy? Aye. Councilmember Scipio? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adams? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Councilmember McIntosh? Aye. Councilmember Burke? Yes. Thank you. That is unanimous. Let's go to item C21 then. I see item C21, resolution electing the 2021 inductees to the Winston Salem Arts, Culture, and Entertainment Memorial Walk of Fame, recommended by Community Development Housing General Government Committee. Yeah, thank you, Councilman Mundy. Uh, I think it's important that we do review these. So, uh, Mr. Rao, would you uh, go through the list of the uh, those who have been elected to the uh, or recommended to the City Council for election? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Joins, Mayor Pro Tempore Adams, and members of the City Council. I have prepared just a, br a brief presentation uh, to present the uh, finalists for the 2021. Uh, Walk of Fame class. So, uh, Meredith, you go to the next slide there. And just a brief history the uh, Walk of Fame was created by the City Council in November 2015 at the uh, direction of Mayor Pro Tempore Adams. Uh, the, the program recognizes deceased city residents who made a significant contribution to the arts and entertainment industry. Uh, the, the actual walk is located on the Cherry Street sidewalk next to the Benton. And, uh, and under the, the uh, program guidelines, the election is limited to five nominations each year. Next slide. So uh, just to, to look at kind of the process, the nomination process opens in January each year. The nominations were reviewed by a diverse panel of citizens who represent the various artistic disciplines and fields within the entertainment industry. The review panel's recommendations then go uh, to the uh, Community Development Housing General Government Committee for their review. 
and then they make a recommendation to the full council, uh, which is occurring tonight for final approval. Uh, the program is administered by the marketing and communications department and the annual budget, uh, which really uh, consists of the, the purchase of the stars and the installation of the stars is paid out of the uh, Oxley tax fund. Then very quickly, the nomination criteria uh, for the Walk of Fame, the nominee uh, is deceased. The nominee was a resident of Winston-Salem for at least five years. The nominee made a significant contribution to the arts and entertainment industry in one of a number of disciplines. And when we say significant, we mean that what they uh, contributed was iconic in terms of the impact on the artistic di disciplines or popular culture. Uh, the nominee exhibited sustained excellence in his or her field for at least five years. And then the nominee made distinguished contributions to the community and uh, civic organizations, civic oriented participation. So with that, just wanna present the nominees. We did receive six uh, nominees, John Ely in the category of writing, Erling King in the category of visual arts, Joe King in visual arts, Sam Moss in music, Johann Friedrich Peter in music, and then Stuart Scott in television. So the review panel uh, met you know, a couple of months ago, reviewed the nominees, and then the finalists that were presented to the Community Development Housing General Government Committee uh, are, next slide. Uh, you can see there John Ely, Erling King, Joe King, Sam Moss, and Stuart Scott. So I will very briefly highlight the accomplishments of these individuals. Uh, John Ely uh, was considered the father of Appalachian literature. He had 17 books of, fic of fiction and nonfiction. He was a member of the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame. Uh, he was the founder of the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. And then he uh, served as a special assistant to Governor Terry Sanford and was instrumental in the creation of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. And you can see there in the lower uh, right-hand corner that probably his uh, uh, breakout uh, book was The Landbreakers. The next uh, finalist is Erling King. She is a well-known sculptor. She and her husband, Joe King, who's also a nominee, were graduates of R.J. Reynolds High School. Uh, she completed 345 commissions in public art over 43 years. And some of the highlights uh, includes a statue of Simon G. Atkins, a bust of Governor James Hunt, the bust of Sir Winston Churchill, and I think in the pictures there you can also see the uh, statue of R.J. Reynolds. The uh, sculptor and pottery studio at the uh, Arts Council Center is named for her. <clears throat> the next finalist is uh, her husband, Joe King. He was a portrait painter. He developed uh, what's called the Vinciata style of painting. And you can see there an example of that with uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, a number of his works were displayed in the Hammer Galleries in New York City for 20 years. He also had works displayed in Europe, uh, including Rome and Florence. And uh, just one uh, noteworthy fact, his portrait of Queen Elizabeth II was commissioned by Bureau's Welcome Foundation and presented to the state of North Carolina to celebrate 400 years in the New World, and that hangs in the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh. And Sam Moss uh, was a well-respected and nationally recognized guitarist. Also, he uh, had a store, Sam Moss Guitars, on, on Burke Street, and he played in numerous bands and mentored countless uh, local and national musicians. And finally, the, the fifth nomination, the fifth finalist is uh, Stuart Scott. Uh, he was a graduate of R.J. Reynolds High School in UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, he was an ESPN Sports Center anchor and also, uh, also uh, anchored sometimes their NBA and NFL coverage. He is well known for his hip hop style and his use of catchphrases there. And you can see some of those examples uh, there. So he is our fifth finalist. And just to conclude, uh, the stars uh, for the class of 2021 and for the class of 2020 will be unveiled on July 30th of this year at 10 a.m. there beside the Benton. Uh, in the past, we've, we've coordinated the unveiling to coincide with the National Black Theater Festival because the, the National Black Theater Festival has been canceled. We're still gonna proceed with unveiling the class of 2020 and the class of 2021. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Are there any questions for Mr. Rao? Thank you. It's a great, uh, great program. Uh, Mr. Mundy, if you're comfortable, I'd entertain a motion to approve the slate 
Absolutely. Move to approve uh, C-21, the resolution inducting the 2021 honorees into the Memorial Walk of Fame. Second. Thank you. Motion second. Is there any discussion? All right. Going to the roll call. Councilmember Larson. Yes. Councilmember Clark. Yes. Councilmember Mundy. Aye. Councilmember Scipio. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adams. Yes. Councilmember Taylor. Yes. Councilmember McIntosh. Aye. Councilmember Burke. Yes. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. And thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Mundy. It's a great idea to make sure we highlight those. The council will now go to the general agenda, which is comprised of the following. There's an item awarding a construction contract for Cloverdale pedestrian improvements, a second reading on a UDO text amendment, an item related to a commission to study the issue of reparations and the public comment period. The public comment period is a time set aside once per month for citizens to voice their opinions on matters that are germane to city government. When this virtual comment period is called, each speaker will be given three minutes for comment and the comment period will be limited to 30 minutes. Skinny, will we have the first item, please? Item G1, resolution awarding construction contract for Cloverdale mm -hmm. Avenue pedestrian improvements to Smith Road, LLC. Finance committee forwarded this item with that recommendation. There were some comments and questions on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Clark, are you ready to make a motion? Yes, I'd make a uh, motion to approve, please. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, McIntosh. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, Councilor Moran, uh, excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Adams? Yes. Uh, I would just like to ask Mr. DeCane, uh, what type of process do we have in place to ensure that the Smith Road organization complies to our city policies so far as doing the work, completing the work, and ensuring customer quality. Mr. Duquesne. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. Um, as uh, Mayor Pro Tem recommended at the Finance Committee, I had a chance to go back and look at the contractor's performance on the 2014 Polo Road Project. Um, the issues that there, there were several issues with the project, uh, namely the, the, the main concern was timeliness, um, of the project and the impact to the surrounding community, the neighborhood and the travelers and, um, and the mayor pro tem as a resident, as a matter of fact, who was, who was directly affected by that. So she had firsthand experience. Um, so what, what staff has done is we, we learned from those experiences. We have worked with the contractor since then. Um, with um, and making sure they adhere to all their contract specifications and namely the schedule. We have had a, another successful project with them. Uh, the Reynolds Park Road bridges, uh, the, those replacements uh, actually went very well. And uh, that uh, all the lessons we learned on Polar Road were applied to, to that project. And we're confident that uh, we can do the same on this one. So staff does recommend approval. And, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for... for allowing me to get a history lesson on our bond projects. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Any questions, Mr. Kane? Councilman Mundy? I was just going to say thank you to Mayor Pro Tem Adams for bringing that issue to my attention. I did do my homework, talked to the engineering department, and after those discussions, I do feel comfortable moving forward. Wonderful, thank you. We do have a motion to approve. A yes vote is to approve this contract. Councilman Larson? Yes. Councilmember Clark? Yes. Councilmember Mundy? Aye. Councilmember Scipio? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adams? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Councilmember uh, McIntosh? Aye. And Councilmember Burke? Yes. Thank you. That is approved unanimously. Item G2. Item G2, second reading on ordinance amending chapter four. Chapter 5, 6, and 11 of the Unified Development Ordinance to revise mixed use, special use provisions, and to add provisions for cottage courts. This item received a vote of five in favor and three opposed at the April 5th, 2021 City Council meeting, lacking the required two thirds majority vote for adoption on its first read. The item is placed on this agenda for a second reading. This is a second reading of this ordinance. I would entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve, McIntosh. Second. Second. Clark. Second. Clark. All right. 
we typically don't have discussion on the second reading, so I'll go straight into the uh, roll call. Councilor Mayor, Moore. Mayor, oh, excuse, excuse me. Mayor President, there is, yeah, there is the protocol of actually reading this for the record, and the city clerk sent me the motion to be read for item G2. Okay, um, Mr. McIntosh, do you have that motion? No, I defer to Mayor Pro Tem on that. All right, Mayor Pro Tem, would you mind reading it for the record? Yes, thank you. I move for one approval of the statement of consistency for approval of this item, and two approval of item agenda item G two. And Mr. Okay. Clark, you going to second that? Yes, done again. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. It's time. Any uh, any discussion of Mayor Pro Tem's motion? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Customer Clark. Yeah, I did not have a chance to comment this first time, but I just want to say I think there are times that reasonable people can disagree, and I think this is one of those. I wasn't surprised it was a 5 3 vote. I struggled with it a lot um, seven or eight years ago, five years ago, whenever we did the, uh, the previous one. Uh, we got it wrong, and, and it, as a result, it killed any development in this area. Uh, hopefully, this is better, but I, I'm willing to certainly look at it in a couple of years and see if it's done what it's supposed to do. It hasn't done what some people fear it will do. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right, go straight to the vote then. Uh, yes vote approves this uh, UDO amendment. Councilor Larson. A no. Councilor Clark. Yes. Councilor Scipio. No. Mayor Pro Tem Adams. Yes. Councilor Taylor. Yes. Councilor McIntosh. Aye. Councilmember Burke. No. And the motion does pass a motion with a vote of five in favor of three opposed. That does mean that this uh, ordinance is. I'm sorry. Mayor, just. Oh, did I miss Councilmember Monday? You did. I'm my sorry. vote is my vote is aye. So that uh, you did predict the future there. I, I wrote it down. I'm sorry, <laughs> Councilmember Monday. So we have a, a five in favor and uh, three opposed. So the uh, ordinance is approved. Thank you all very much. Uh, item G3. Item G3, resolution calling for federal and state action to establish a commission to study the issue of reparations for black African-American citizens. Recommended by Community Development Housing General Government Committee with three in favor and one of state. Thank you. Without objection, I'd like for our city man, uh, assistant city manager, Tasha Logan Ford, to give us just a brief uh, comment on uh, this resolution and its contents. Thank you, Mayor Joins. Mayor Pro Tem Adam, members of the council. Item G3 is a resolution that looks for us to um, discuss issues of, of reparations. Um, we first begun this conversation in August of 2020, discussing three particular communities and the actions that they had taken around uh, reparations for African Americans. Um, we had some additional follow-up conversations that took place in March, and the focus of those conversations was looking at five North Carolina cities, the resolutions that they had passed and the items that were covered, and Assistant City Attorney Keisha Redd presented that information, along with additional information around the impacts of urban renewal in the Winston-Salem community. The resolution that you have before you this evening, there are six different components of the resolution. The first component apologizes for the participation in slum clearance associated with urban renewal in Winston-Salem. The second piece of the resolution calls for the United States Congress to pass H.R. 40, which establishes a federal commission to study and develop reparations proposals for Black and African Americans that look at the legacy of slavery and discrimination in the United States, and then provides recommendations to Congress to um, implement remedies to address the lingering impacts. The third piece calls for the North Carolina General Assembly to pass similar legislation and complete a parallel process along with the one that would take place at the federal level. The fourth component calls for the African American Heritage Initiative to develop for publishing on the city's website 
a narrative about the history of Black and African American churches, businesses, neighborhoods, and cultural institutions that were lost due to slum and urban renewal projects, such as the Cherry Marshall Expressway, Highway 52, and what we now call Salem Parkway. The fifth component directs the manager to give at a minimum a biannual update to city council on the progress of work associated with this resolution. And then the final piece just asks that the city clerk forward copies of the resolution to the governor for the state of North Carolina. The city of Winston-Salem's delegation at the North Carolina Drill Assembly, House Representatives, and the Senate. The resolution is presented to council after going through the General Government Committee for your consideration this evening. Thank you, Ms. Logan Ford. Are there any questions, Ms. Logan Ford? Thank you. I want to recognize Mayor Pro Tem Adams. This did come from your committee. And would you like to make a motion and then make comments if you're inclined? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, I move for approval of item G3. Second. Second. All right. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, would you like to make comments? Or? I just want to thank the staff. Uh, uh, Ms. Logan Ford, Attorney Red, Attorney Carmen, uh, also the wonderful Ms. Meredith Martin, uh, for all the work that they put in uh, for us to gather this body of information or work. Uh, we are not behind on this. Uh, we are right where we need to be along with other cities in North Carolina, as well as cities across the country as well as the present conversations being held uh, at our Congress about uh, reparations. There is a lot of education that will take place to help citizens and people understand what we mean when we mean equity, equality, or reparations, or just having the opportunity to a quality of life. I know a lot of people think that, and I've, out of all of these emails I've gotten over the weeks and months, I probably have gotten maybe five that were against what this is about. And they felt that they should not be held accountable for what was done and did hundreds of years ago. But I beg to differ. Some of my colleagues have heard my argument about that, that if you benefit from the good work or work of others, uh, the success, all of it, then you basically owe some level of a responsibility to the people that did not benefit from it. The legacy, the children, no generational wealth or anything like that, opportunities in education, a house and other things. And so, what we're doing here is hoping again to clear some minds and hearts and hopefully get Winston-Salem on the right page of history to letting our public and citizens and the world know that we recognize our greatness didn't just come by itself. Our greatness came from the sacrifice and work of a people that were not compensated for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Councilmember Mundy. I would like to, as a uh, white counterpart who has benefited from all of those things that Mayor Pro Tem uh, just talked about, echo everything that she said. Uh, if, if you read the resolution, this is not just talking about the 50s and 60s. This is talking about centuries of um, unfair treatment to African Americans, to the black population. We, whether uh, it, no one on this council was actively involved, but previous councils uh, either um, enforced, enacted or enforced laws like uh, during the Jim Crow era, like redlining and so forth, um, that was simply wrong. It was morally wrong. And I personally didn't make any of those decisions, but I personally have benefited and it is well past time for us to make an apology for those things. So I support this 100%. Councilor Larson. You're muted. I'm muted now. 
I mean, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I've received a lot of inquiries, and I want to be very clear about one thing about this resolution, and it is that, despite of the term um, of, uh, this being that's being used, that there is no monetary compensation component of this particular piece of action that we're taking tonight. We're in fact leaving that up to the state and the federal government to untangle that. And I think that's rightfully, that's where it needs to reside. I think the important thing about tonight is that we are recognizing a legacy of injustices and inequality that has existed, not only during the Civil War, but in the decades and generations that followed. And that we, we are now confronting that in our society and we will continue to confront it until we actually recognize it and address it. This is a first attempt, I think, by city council to do just that and I will be supporting it tonight. Thank you very much. All right, we're ready to vote. Yes, vote. Uh, yes. Supports. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Burke, pardon me. I just wanted to say that this apology is a first step in acknowledging that what was done was wrong. And this acknowledgement has to be followed up with layers of action to show the sincerity of this apology. And among the many layers of action that needs to take place, I'm just uh, very hopeful about our new DEI office, our diversity and inclusion office. And I'm just hopeful with the role that I know that they will play going forward in ensuring that fairness and inclusiveness uh, are included in all of the actions that our city will take place going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Clark. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd stand at this at the uh, committee level and I will be voting against it tonight. I have major issues with the way we're treating the people that sit in our seats 20 to 30, 50 years ago, particularly as it relates to Highway 52 and urban renewal. I have a hard time demonizing people that sat in our seats in the 60s when we did the identical thing that we're condemning them for as recently as two weeks ago. As we speak, homes are being torn down to build about way around the city that we all endorsed. Matter of fact, I was the council representative on the chamber committee that, that uh, uh, lobbied Raleigh to do it. Two weeks ago, this council unanimously and with great fanfare clapped as we approved a rezoning that is resulting in over a hundred residences being torn down, people's apartments, those are homes, those peoples are being uh, displaced. Uh, we cheered when we approved and accepted the $30 million choice neighborhood money that will displace thousands of people. If it was wrong then, why is it right now? I truly believe that the folks that sat in these seats 40, 50 years ago did what they think was right. Were there unintended consequences? Certainly, and we need to learn from those. But times change, cities change. I think the important thing we should learn from this is that communities are more than buildings, it's people and it's, it's a personality. And we, as we displace people, as the city grows, whatever, we need to understand that th these are real people and they need to be treated fairly as we do it. Uh, example, I would give some very well-intended folks in this community announced abruptly a project in the Boston Thurman area. Uh, there was a significant outcry from the neighborhood because they hadn't been consulted. And I think that was a very good example of what not to do. And I will actually compliment uh, Councilman Adams, who stood up for the community and said, wait a minute, everybody needs to be involved. These are real people here. I think we should learn from the past, but I will not demonize folks that do the same things that we do today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Clark. All right, uh, Councilman Scipio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and fellow council members. I really wasn't gonna say anything because this touches me in a very deep way. What we have to understand is that oppression and discrimination has been in America against African-Americans since 1619. Laws, behaviors were enacted 
that oppressed all African Americans for hundreds of years. It's not just taking down houses or building roads. The legacy of racism and discrimination goes far beyond those things, but we must be mindful of every decision we do make. The legacy is still with us. There is not one African American who, if they were honest, would say that I've had a wonderful ride in America and in North Carolina and in Winston-Salem. But because when I go forth, people see my color and they treat me based on their biases, biases that they are taught. They may not want to admit it, but how we feel about people has a lot to do with how we, raise, we are raised. So yes, this is very important for us to say, it's not demonizing our former, our ancestors. It's trying to say, that we all have played a part in this, whether I'm wearing the burden of racism on my back every day, or if my friend is benefiting in some kind of way because they see my people differently. This isn't about one action, but I will charge us if we go forward with this, and I hope we do, that we look at every decision we make through the lens of oppression or discrimination. It is so easy to go along with the flow of trying to do what other folks make think it's right, but it's wrong. I will tell you that I've had to forgive every person who has looked at me in a negative way because of the color of my skin. My first reality was when I was five years old walking down Main, walking above Main Street on 4th Street and a little white girl spat at me and my mother because we were walking across Main Street. That was the dividing line for black people. You stayed below that. So I had to forgive that child. Why did she do that? Just because I'm a colored girl. We have to understand that racism, race hatred, everything that's happened to black people is still happening today. The fact is, we are not crying out. We are not, we're going on with life because we have to, and we have to forgive those who oppress us in order for us to wake up and breathe every day, every moment. And the legacy of all of that is seen in our neighborhoods and in our communities. So forgiveness is the first step towards healing. You can't resolve a problem until you admit what the problem really is and how it came to be. Unfortunately, it's a burden I have borne all of my 72 years. Every black child that's born today has to start bearing that burden. We have been victimized and we continue to be that. We are not privileged and when you see us, you see our wholeness. Yes, we are strong, yes. We are magnificent, and yes, we will continue to thrive and to overcome in spite of. So I say to everyone, this is the first act of love. I am happy to vote in favor of it because it sets a pace that we can follow because we are admitting Everyone is admitting that it was wrong. Everything, not just the shackles of slavery, 
but the shackles of everything else that came with it. And you can't understand it if you were never a victim of it. And I can tell you, I'm tired of being a victim, trying to make my way in a nation that's supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, when I know that burden that we have to wake up every morning to bear. So I'm through with that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember. I'm going to go to the roll call. A yes vote approves this resolution. Councilmember Larson. Yes, support it. Councilmember Clark. No. Councilmember Mundy. Aye. Councilmember Scipio. Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Adams. Yes. Councilmember Taylor. Yes. Councilmember McIntosh. <clears throat> Aye. Councilmember Burke. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes seven uh, in favor, one opposed. Council McCart voting in the uh, opposition. Thank you all very much. Item G4. Item G4, public comment period. Again, this is a time that the city council and I invite citizens to speak to us on moderate matters that are germane to city government. When your name is called, if you give your name and address for the record and limit your comments to three minutes, and we set aside 30 minutes for this public comment period. First person is Katie Morawski. Uh, yes, my name is Katie Morawski. I live at 27103, and I'm speaking for Triad Abolition Project in solidarity with the Forsyth County Police Accountability and Reallocation Coalition. Um, with one remaining public session before the Finance Committee's budget workshops begin in May, uh, we ask again for the City Council and managers to reallocate funds from the WSPD budget into anti-poverty and care-oriented uh, initiatives. It is our hope that we as the Winston-Salem community will continue to push for the creation of new and thriving alternatives to the city and county services of policing and incarceration. In addition to the work towards uh, funding existing anti-poverty and social justice services, we would also love to support work towards uh, responding to mental health crisis calls and mental health professionals rather than deputies or officers. Our country continues to mourn the murders of black men at the hands of officers and now nationwide uh, steps towards divesting from policing services with reinvestment in community care initiatives is not only visionary work done by social justice leaders, but also a reality as it is happening in the new budget cycles in Minneapolis, uh, Austin, Los Angeles, Milwaukee, and more. The call to reallocate funds from the police department into community care oriented initiatives, such as the police diversion model of a mental health crisis unit, are not at all uh, unique to Winston-Salem, and they're completely doable with the resources we have here in our city and county. The United States Police Department's ranked third among, the, among worldwide military expenditures. This does not keep us safe. This is in fact is as harmful as it shows a moral commitment to prosecuting, harming, harming, incarcerating and murdering the people and more often results in police brutality on our black and brown community members due to systemic racism. Furthermore, uh, with the equipment and technology programming purchased with federal grants, uh, the WSPD has the resources to divert calls to mental health professionals at 911 dispatch. Uh, for example, it states in the coronavirus emergency relief fund that part of the half a million grant went towards uh, an online citizen reporting system in which, and I quote, allows non-emergency inbound calls to be routed to the web application providing individuals with instant access to the police department's customized uh, non-reporting incident reporting website while freeing up staff uh, to respond to emergency calls that require immediate attention, unquote. We believe that this type of technology there must be uh, the materials in place already to divert calls from armed officers to mental health professionals when calls are specifically for and by folks facing challenges of mental health crises or substance abuse emergencies. In addition to your effort to support reparation, all that is supported across the nation at this time, and it should have been way long ago, the time is now that you realize that they recognize that the system is safe. Thank you. Doug McManus. 
Yes, my name is Duck McManus at 27104, and I am speaking for Triad Abolition Project in solidarity with the Forsyth County Police Accountability and Reallocation Coalition. With only one remaining public comment session before the Finance Committee's budget workshops begin in May, we ask again for City Council and City Managers to reallocate funds from the WSPD budget into anti-poverty and care-oriented initiatives. I'd like to remind you of SC Park's long-term demands. We demand that you reallocate a portion of the $78 million WSPD budget to, into community programs such as SOAR and Youth Build, create forgivable loans for black businesses, increase citywide minimum wage, end cash bail in Forsyth County, create and implement a mental health crisis intervention mobile unit, create and implement an independent civilian police oversight authority for WSPD and FCSO, and to demilitarize WFCD the WSPD and FCSO. As of today, FC Park has received no response from Public Safety Committee Chairs James Taylor and Tasha Long Ford concerning the alternative response model and the Mental Health Crisis Intervention Mobile Unit. On June 8th, the Public Safety Committee meeting allowed public comments, which resulted in more discussion over the decision to find the $1 million to reallocate from the general fund to community resources. Public comment during committee meetings should be routine. Significantly, too, I believe that city council should include Spanish translations of all city council meetings in real time. This has not yet been done, but Mayor Alan Joins has had this issue brought to his attention and so he is well aware. Without streaming the city council meetings with a Spanish translation in real time, we are not including our entire community, and this needs to be addressed as soon as possible. City council members, you have heard numerous public comments from concerned community members exercising the space of the public comment period as a time for being heard by you, but you have not given any responses in the past months. I urge you to use the time of this meeting to respond to us. Your dismissive behavior towards community, community organizers and community members is a gross use of your power as officials elected by this community. We know of at least three current city council members who are endorsed by the Police Benevolent Association, Annette Scipio of the East Ward, Barbara Burke of the Northeast Ward, and Kevin Mundy of the Southwest Ward. The cost of this endorsement per council member, according to campaign funds, is $1,000 each. That's a total of $3,000 to buy council members for further lobbying for increasing taxpayer funds towards WSPD. We can understand why this would lead to a corruptly motivated support of the WSPD in the public eye. Time is up, thank you. Emily, uh, excuse me, Becky Painter. Hi, my name is Becky Painter. I live in 27104 and um, uh, I've lived in Winston-Salem the majority of my life. And I've, uh, it's been great to hear you all speak tonight and the efforts to move forward with uh, reparations is um, really good news. And I know we have a long way to go. So thank you for your, your work on that. Um, and I, um, I've been an educator for over 15 years, worked with all sorts of kids, but particularly have found a spot with um, high school students who aren't exactly served well by the systems that are in place. And so I'm here to advocate largely that we do allocate some funds for SOAR and Youth Build um, because we need opportunities for these students who may not follow the model that uh, we, we tend to sell as, as the way to go for every kid. Um, we need to have places a little bit more funds available so that we have um, work opportunities and training opportunities to serve our youth, as we all know, uh, well, well served and educated um, and trained youth is going to only benefit our city in the future. And so I'd love for us to, to move forward on that and to allocate a little bit of our, our large budget um, that others have mentioned is going toward police, that, a lot of our police funding toward that. Um, and also second the, or third or fourth the motions to um, also allocate some funds toward mental health um, as I think that would benefit um, our community all around. So thanks for y'all's work and uh, I hope that you're hearing what we have to say this evening. Emily Barnes. 
Hi, my name is Emily. I live in 27105, and I'm speaking for Triad Evolution Project in solidarity with Forsyth County Police Accountability and Reallocation Coalition, or FC Park. With only one remaining public comment session before the Finance Committee's budget workshops begins in May, we ask again for the City Council and City Managers to reallocate funds from WSPD budget into anti-poverty and care-oriented initiatives. Since August 2020, Triad Abolition Project has supported community members in sharing their voices in public comment sessions. We have supported a total of 28 public comments, this being our 29th. As of yet, none of these comments have resulted in a response from city council, and we have witnessed on multiple occasions as city council members have looked distracted, taken phone calls, even told us that we can't expect change in public forums. I want to be here. I wouldn't rather be gardening, and neither should you. We have been present in city council meetings, city council committee meetings, trust talks, the city council special meetings, why are you, city council members, wasting our time with your negligence and silence? You're supposed to represent the public, and the public will not be silenced. Nationwide and locally, we continue to witness harms and murders at the hands of police brutality. We continue to demand that the city divest from WSPD's bloated $78 million budget and reinvest in community initiatives. FC Park has asked for updates from Public Safety Committee Chair James Taylor, City Manager Tasha Logan Ford, Mayor Joins, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, but has not received a, in a response for updates on the city's promise to work toward a mental health crisis unit as a police diversion model for mental health and substance use crisis calls. Still, we witness and experience the harm of WSPD responding to mental health crisis calls with squad cars, canine units, and other forms of escal escalation that threaten the lives of our community members. Mayor Joins, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, and council members, as a voting constituent in Winston-Salem, I demand that you respond to Triad Abolition Product Project and FC Park to reallocate WSPD funds toward new initiatives that center care, not cops. I also kindly ask that you respond to me. Thank you. Miranda Jones. Yes, good evening. Miranda Jones, Southwest New York. Dear Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of city council, I'm getting lots of feedback. Hold on, I'm sorry. Sorry for the technical difficulties. All right. Dear Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of City Council, I'm sure that you all are tired of hearing from us, the people. I'm sure you already know what we're going to say before we say it. I'm sure your internal dialogue is something like, oh Lord, here they go again. Guess what? You are right. We are here again and we plan to keep coming back. You might ask yourself, why? In the words of Billy Preston, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Yet we, the people, remain doggedly undaunted. We, the people, have been coming since last summer. Some of us have been coming longer than that, asking that you put the people's money where your mouth is. We have been asking that you increase funding for SOAR to the tune of $3 million. We got nothing. We have asked that you reignite youth bill to the tune of $3 million. We got nothing. We have asked for an alternative mental health response model. We got nothing. We presented at your committees. We got nothing. We did the research you said we needed to do. We got nothing. You asked us to speak nicely, tone policing groups led by black women. You got nothing. However, our disappointment is not, is not only in getting nothing, but it's truly embedded in the fact that some of us voted for you because we believed in your platforms when you, when you were campaigning. I voted for Council Member Monday because he's a member of a marginalized group. I thought he would fight as hard for my people as he would from his own. For my own, I got nothing. For some of my black Democrats on the council, some of us have supported you much to the chagrin of others in the activist community. We did not attack. We did not denigrate. We did not cast down. We got advice. We got meetings. We got suggestions for strategy. We didn't get what we came for. Some of you are leaders of wars that could benefit greatly from what we are demanding. Some of you have said you won't defund the police and refund the people. Some of you have said you won't reallocate. Some, some have said just wait until re-election time. 
We cannot accept any of this. Truth is, some of you will be elected no matter what we say. But what have you done for the people? We don't need you to study reparations. Reparations for black people are long overdue. A committee is a start, but next year we will realize we got nothing. Studying poverty, nothing. We are not anti-research, but in the words of Arrested Development speech, talk up, talk up, but don't talk up all night. There's got to be action if you want satisfaction. If not for yourself, then the young ones, the children. I'll end with this. In the wake of oppression, the powerful will ask the oppressed to choose peace. What they really mean is order. Peace requires justice by Brittany Packett. Thank you. I yield. Colleen Johnson. Hi, this is Celine Johnson, 27103. Greetings. I'm here representing Hate Out of Winston, a bunch of activists who are outside City Hall with me, and I'm also representing local professionals who work in the fields of mental health, intellectual developmental disabilities, substance use disorder, social work, and or other human services fields to remind our elected officials that Winston-Salem needs an alternative and layered mental health response program. I'm also here to ask that our city officials, especially those on the Public Safety Committee, be transparent as they go through the process of 911 call data analysis, the review of mental health response models, and the selection of the model that Winston-Salem will use as its pilot program. I want to reiterate that we strongly oppose a solely co-responder program for the city of Winston-Salem. People call 911 when they are in distress because it has brand recognition. We recommend that Winston-Salem implement a mental health alternative and layered response program wherein 911 dispatchers are trained to dispatch mental health professionals and medic teams to nonviolent, non-criminal calls, law enforcement to criminal and violent calls, and layered both mental health professionals and law enforcement when both are needed. Estimates suggest that 25 to 50% of all fatal law enforcement encounters involve people with mental illness. The presence of law enforcement can further exacerbate or escalate situation, especially for black and brown people who deal with chronic and persistent mental health issues as a result of generations of trauma and systemic oppression. Professionals who are fully trained in mental health crisis have been shown to have the opposite effect, calming, de-escalating, and redirecting. The vast majority of people with mental health problems are no more likely to be violent than anyone else. In the U.S., only 3 to 5 percent of violent acts can be attributed to individuals with serious mental illness. In fact, people with severe mental illness are over 10 times more likely to be victims of violent crime than the general population. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, specifically recommends responding to mental health and substance abuse calls without law enforcement accompaniment, unless special circumstances warrant. And cities across the U.S. have successfully piloted or implemented these alternative and layered response programs consistent with this recommendation. Our goal is not to demonize law enforcement, but to address the fact that they are not properly trained to be the primary or most appropriate responders in all situations. There are times when law enforcement is the right professional, and there are times when they are the default professional simply because of the existing system. We recommend expanding our 911 system to provide more appropriate emergency responses, resulting in safer and better outcomes for all. Thank you. My name is Karen <clears throat> at 27012 zip code, and I am speaking for Triad Abolition Project in solidarity with the Forsyth County Police Accountability and Reallocation Coalition. With only one remaining public session before the Finance Committee's budget workshops begin in May, we ask again for the City Council and City Managers to reallocate funds from Winston-Salem Police Department budget into anti-poverty and care-oriented initiatives. Councilman Clark is far off the mark in voting against the reparation study. However, he is right in pointing to the multiple ways that his fellow council members continue to uphold racist policies, ones that result in citizens losing their homes and increasing the gulf between the poor and wealthy in this city. Council members would be served to not separate themselves from their counterparts in the 60s in highlighting how racism has impacted black people in this city, but also focusing on how every council member currently serving in this city continues to contribute to the reinforcement of racist practices here. 
In reference to this reparations apology, apologies are simple to administer. Anyone can give them, saying things like, we did the best we could with the information we had, actually deflects accountability. It also dismisses the generations of harm inflicted by the state. Meaningful and radical change takes a lot more effort than a simple apology from an institution that continues to fuel cycles of oppression. Urban renewal is an interesting way to spell gentrification, and continuing to invest in law enforcement to surveil the community serves to only make matters worse. WSPD lists two objectives this year and beyond. One is to expand community policing, and another is to reduce crime and fear of crime. But how does this serve a community when fear of punishment, harm, and even death by police is the issue? How does this serve a community that needs funds reallocated to community-controlled resources, such as housing, employment, food, healthcare, education, and anti-poverty initiatives? Meeting those basic needs is a form of reparations. Community-oriented policing is still policing, and the police do not reduce harm. They respond to it and cause more harm to Black communities. In November 2020, a WSPD officer slammed a 15-year-old Black girl to the street. This brutality did not end with the girl being slammed to the ground. She was pressed down while two officers held their knees to her back. She was yelled at, and the door was slammed on her when she was forced inside of a patrol vehicle. More importantly, she never should have been stopped by the police when she was walking with her friends in the first place. You continue to want more officers, more community policing, more patrol, more surveillance, more task forces, and the list goes on. Yet this is completely counterproductive you. in your Time proposed request. Nathal Snipes. Hello, how y'all doing? How everybody doing? Good. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by uh, commending everybody for, you know, saying a uh, job well done. All the elected officials that uh, we put in power to delegate to a minister. Um, I know it's a hard task, but, you know, so I want to commend y'all on, you know, yeah, at least Mr. trying. Snipes, would you state your name and address for the record, please? Okay. For uh, on and for the record, my name is Nathan Artillery Snipes. And that, that style, in accordance to 6 CFR 37.3, is that's the real identification act that style of name is to be used in all caps and any uses of that name and any variation or abbreviation it will be prosecuted for fraud trespass you know um but um like i said i want to commend everybody um i have three complaints my first complaint is in regards to the probable cause hearing uh, inmates are being prosecuted illegally, being denied due process um, in accordance to 15A, I mean, Article 25 in North Carolina General Statute, 15A, 521. All inmates, anybody arrested and uh, 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 detained to the facility are supposed to have a probable cause hearing no, late, no longer than 15 days, no less than five days. Only way they are not to get this by law is by waiver. And... Uh, these individuals are denying us our probable cause right. The evidence is in our in the clerk's office in everybody's file without um, no no signing of the waiver. That's the first. You know, a lot of inmates are being locked up, not going to court, being held for two years, three years without even going to court. They're being denied due process. That's the first I want to investigate. Second is the child support. Child support is in accordance with federal law uh, uh, housed under the executive uh, branch. But when you go to court, it's being administered by state officials. You see a judge, and it clearly says that it's a cooperative agreement in, according to federal law. So that judges are not supposed to, judge and judiciary departments are not supposed to administer this hearing. But instead, when we go to court, we are being uh, uh, judged and ruled on by these uh, state officials, which is a, a violation of separation of power, our constitutional right. Again, another constitutional right violation. Uh, my third... And um, my third is, like I said, I want to uh, thank everybody who's calling in for the reparations. Anybody that's not against, anybody that's not endorsing the reparations or showing you that they're not uh, endorsing, promoting equal rights and protection for all their citizens. You know, you, you should already know that. that. That's just common sense. But I just want these three acts investigated. The probable cause hearing with the inmates downtown 
because they're we, through our investigation. We your time is up, Mr. Snipes. All right, thank Darryl, you, you, st you stay. Sh Harold used to ask 27104. Thank you, uh, Council, for allowing my comment. Uh, I think that reparations are a divisive idea. I think we, as a community, have an opportunity to show um, that we're about unity and, and not division. And, um, the, the divisiveness of relitigating the past will further divide our community. I think um, we can all agree that universally that slavery is a terrible institution and everything about it is. But uh, as a black man, I can trace my lineage on one side of my family um, back to the late 1600s. Um, we're very proud of that in my family. But on the other side of my family, I'm a first generation immigrant uh, whose family has never uh, known slavery. So do I get reparations? The fact is that many black Americans have a lineage like mine that can't trace it back to slavery or maybe halfway can. Moreover, so, many do, so do many white Americans. Most estimates are that between one and 2% of whites in the United States at the time owned slaves. Even more importantly, over half of whites currently in America have families that immigrated from Europe after slavery and many after 1900. We'd essentially be asking for citizens who literally very likely have nothing to do with slavery to pay money or property to citizens who may or may not have any lineage either. Um, there's no, no doubt that you know, slavery and Jim Crow are terrible stains in our history and, and really hurt every community, especially the black community. I understand racism personally. You know, my first day, I just a couple of my first day at the North Carolina School of Science and Math, I'm only thinking that because you guys brought that up earlier about the founder of Science and Math. Um, I was told by a professor that I wouldn't be there if I wasn't black. And he didn't know that I was the number one student in my class before I got there. Um, and when I was in the Army, I got called the N-word too many times to count to be honest. So I get it. Uh, the legacy of African Americans is one of, of a people who have overcome every single obstacle in spite of the odds. But money from the government is not the answer. Uh, so the question now is how do we address the problems of our community? And I can tell you it's not a handout from the state. So here's the conundrum in 2021. Do we start arguments of who has what sort of blood and what sort of lineage and who's going to pay for it? Or do we move forward including all people. We need, we need to be finding ways to unify our community and not peddle the talking points of those who want us to continue our battles over skin color. You know, this is a political thing. This is evidenced by Durham asking for $15 minimum wage in their residence. We're better than that as a community. I think we can find better ways to support all of our residents. Thank you. Sebastian Clinton, Clintron. Sintron. Hi, uh, Sebastian Sintram. I live in uh, 5460 Bel Air Avenue. In uh, 1778, a document was produced. That document is the framework upon which our country was built. This document was written to help preserve the Union and the freedoms for all that the Union represent. It wasn't perfect, but we have strived to reach that goal ever since its very foundation. Although injustice have been seen within our borders, we have pushed back against it. We have built a nation where individuals of all kinds can enjoy tranquility knowing that their welfare is being defended and the blessings of liberty and prosperity are being secured. This very paragraph I just read to you was written to mirror the preamble of our constitution, for I believe that each and every one of us here present believe in those ideals. And that is why I come to you to present my concern. In the last few years, we have seen a rise of anti-constitutional edicts. We have seen authoritarianism has spread amongst our peoples. Ideas that are determined to undermine all the work that has been put into making United States of America the bastion of freedom that it truly is. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and I came to United States of America uh, after the fabled American dream. But here I stand, watching it go up in flames long before it even has a chance to manifest. And like me, countless others who have come to the line of the free are witnessing those freedoms evaporate. There are many threats to our freedom. Cancel culture has become a modern day inquisition. People are no longer allowed to express their opinions on matters they fear in fear of repercussion. How can we hope to find a better solution, a compromise, a happy medium even, if we shut down all attempts at speech? Every day we see on the news how brands and corporations, along with social media and news media, and even some politicians paint an image of intolerance and dare I say hatred, inciting violence and telling us to get confrontational. 
This polarization is quickly becoming a social enforcement of ideas in such a way that is creating a divide in the people. As a Hispanic, I hope to shed light in our plight. As we all know, for the past year and a half, our world has been hit by a pandemic that has left our economy in shambles and our societal structure near ruins. This led to the accelerated development of multiple vaccines to attempt to combat the pandemic. First and foremost, I will say, I am not an anti-vaxxer, nor do I intend to criticize those who are, nor do I intend to criticize those who take the COVID vaccine. I believe in personal freedoms and body autonomy. And if I may be allowed to quote the slang, your body, your choice. The reason I bring this up, it's the increase in talks regarding the vaccine passport in some places around the world and more troubling within our soil. I am well aware that the Biden administration has said that they will not implement a federal vaccine passport. However, it is working in the private sector to develop standards around such certification. Considering the news regarding the vaccines, such as AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, it's not difficult to understand why some people may choose to wait and see. On top of that, it's worth noting that minority communities, such as my own, have experienced a shortcoming of an... In the Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you for your comments. Uh, council members, that ends our uh, public comment period time frame. Uh, council member Taylor asked to be uh, recognized. Council member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, before I say this, I just want to thank all the public commenters for coming and voicing their concerns. There were some comments specific to the uh, whole response and alternative response models. Uh, that information was discussed in public safety in February. Uh, we did let you know that there was some work that needed to be done by RTI. That information has been tabulated and we will discuss it again at the May Public Safety Committee meeting. Thank you, Councilor Taylor. <laughs> Councilor I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Any comments? All those in favor? Oh, Councilor Clark. Councilor Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? No, I don't need anything. Okay, very good. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Anyone who is opposed to adjourning, please say no. Thank you, council members. We are adjourned. <laughs>